Welcome to the side event of the IRA Thessaloniki plenary meetings about countering distortion. My name is Katrin Meyer and I'm the Secretary General of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. For those of you who are not familiar with our organization, the IRA brings together policymakers and experts from 34 member countries to strengthen Holocaust education, remembrance and research. I would like to welcome heads of delegations, the IRA expert community, as well as other viewers to today's event. I am pleased that the IRA will be launching two new resources today, an explanatory film called Holocaust Distortion, A Growing Threat, and a publication called Holocaust Distortion, Context, Backgrounds, and Examples. Distortion is an issue that has made headlines recently. We've seen many incidents in connection with the pandemic, the COVID-19 yellow stars reading unvaccinated are perhaps the most well-known example. But of course, Holocaust distortion did not start with it and unfortunately will not end with the pandemic. As we will see in the film, Holocaust distortion can be found at all levels of society all over the world. It is the greatest contemporary threat to the legacy of the Holocaust. This is because distortion serves as a bridge between mainstream and radical ideas. It helps Holocaust denial, anti-Semitism, conspiracy myths, and extreme nationalism to thrive. It is no coincidence that extremist groups, no matter where on the political spectrum, all share a distorted view of the Holocaust. But although it's extremely dangerous, distortion is often overlooked. It rarely leads to outrage or to concrete action. These attempts to excuse or minimize or misrepresent the history of the Holocaust harm our democracies and our pluralistic open societies. Holocaust distortion affects all of us and we all have a responsibility to act. But where do we begin? And this is where the IRA comes actually in. Our organization has considered countering Holocaust distortion central to its activities for many years. We create the tools that empower political leaders to take the first steps, to raise awareness, to get engaged, to build a coalition against distortion, which leads to action against anti-Semitism, anti-Roma discrimination, and other forms of hate. This process started in 2013 already, when the IRA adopted a working definition of Holocaust denial and distortion. But it didn't stop there. Since then, the IRA's expert community has continuously offered guidance and recommended action. In, this, in January this year, the IRA, with support of UNESCO, published an action plan on strategies against distortion. These recommendations for policy and decision makers on recognizing and countering distortion are truly comprehensive and address the fields of monitoring, training, museum work, and the sphere of social media. Also in January this year, the IRA started a global awareness raising campaign on social media called Protect the Fact. This campaign was launched in partnership with the European Commission, the United Nations and UNESCO and has proven very successful. It has not only helped raise awareness of distortion, but has also provided a platform for exchange and coalition building. And today we are launching two new resources, a 12 minute explanatory film that offers a first introduction to the topic and a publication that provides more detailed background information. Both resources are suitable for a variety of audiences, including those without prior subject matter knowledge. And both resources can be used in many different contexts, for example, at events and panel discussions like this one, in training and educational programs, in self-learning environments, and in political contexts. These materials, policy recommendations, social media campaigns, explanatory films, and text-based resources are helpful and practical tools. But in order for them to be effective, they need to be used and implemented. To make this easier, the IRAS Permanent Office is working on a toolkit that will be distributed early December. It will package all IRA resources on distortion and will provide you with three concrete ways to counter distortion around the 27th of January for International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Over the next hour, we will learn and exchange about what distortion is, why we need to tackle this, and how individuals, organizations, and governments can help counter this trend. We will first show the 12-minute film. The screening will be followed by a conversation with Dr. Brigitte Beiler from Austria, Ambassador Viktor Mikula from Romania, and Dr. Robert Williams from the US. The session will be moderated by Juliana Bredman from the IRAS Permanent Office. 
During today's event and beyond, I encourage you to think about how we, as national delegations to the IRA, as educators, as museum professionals, diplomats, policymakers, and individuals can help counter distortion. And I encourage you to share suggestions and ideas for how to use these resources with us by the chat function today, during the ongoing IRA plenary meetings or afterwards, and do not hesitate to get in touch with the permanent office. Be an ambassador for change. Please spread the word, share the messages we discussed today. Feel free to use the hashtag understanding distortion when posting on social media. And now let's watch the film. A disturbing phenomenon is on the rise worldwide, Holocaust distortion. The pandemic has accelerated the issue on a global scale. Opponents of measures against the pandemic invoke and distort the crimes of Nazi Germany and its collaborators to paint themselves as victims and their governments as dictatorships. So funktionieren Auschwitz und andere Konzentrationslager. Nur Befehlsnotstand. Es ist eine Schande. Ваше правительство собирается принять такие законы, какие уже в 33-м году принял Гитлер. То есть там Такая группа людей не может садиться в автобус, пойти в магазин, пойти отдыхать. Это сегрегация. И чем это кончилось в 44-м, мы все знаем. Holocaust distortion is the distorting of the facts. It's not like Holocaust denial, where the Holocaust is being denied. It is being claimed it's never happened. Holocaust distortion is more subtle. It's not easy to recognize, but that makes it even more dangerous because if you don't recognize it, then you cannot work against it, then you cannot combat it. Holocaust distortion is dangerous because it is much more cynical and sophisticated than Holocaust denial. Holocaust distortion is a global issue because it can happen everywhere uh, in different layers of the society, geographically, anywhere. All over the world, anti-lockdown protesters compare themselves to Jews living under the Nazi regime. Unvaccinated or non-vaccine is their slogan. No to discrimination, say these protesters in Portugal. Holocaust distortion from the Czech Republic to the United States. People wearing yellow stars with the inscription ungeimpft, unvaccinated on them. The, the Jews in the 1930s, they were subject to very different forms of discrimination, of being deprived of their rights, of being driven out of their professions. No one who is walking in these demonstrations is being forced to wear a yellow star. The benefit of people who distort the Holocaust is uh, on one side because they use this term to raise awareness for a totally different issue. Some people distort the Holocaust out of ignorance. Uh, some others have uh, an agenda behind it. Um, some just don't have enough knowledge. They want to strengthen their argument by comparing whatever issue they have, comparing it to the Holocaust, because it is often being seen in the general public as the ultimate evil. The Holocaust happened all over Europe. Nazi Germany and its collaborators systematically persecuted and murdered about six million Jews, as well as other groups, including Sinti and Roma. The murders were carried out in pogroms, mass shootings, and at concentration and extermination camps. The Nazis deported Jews to Auschwitz-Birkenau and many other camps. Upon arrival at Auschwitz, Men, women and children were forced to stand in line to wait for the selection process to begin. Most were sent immediately to their deaths in the gas chambers. This is the situation to which protesters today are comparing themselves. It is plain disrespect of the victims. They suffered so much. I think it's, it's, it's not, for me, it's not human to, to show s s this sort of disrespect uh, towards uh, these people.
Today, Holocaust distortion has found its way into public discourse, and even into online shops. People want to draw attention to their cause. For example, climate change. Look, I don't care where you go on our planet right now. It is a global climate holocaust. Holocaust distortion can also be found in pop culture, such as film titles. It can be found in literature, it can be found in film and culture, and it can be certainly found online. Holocaust distortion is often spread via social media and online fora. The problem is that online hate doesn't stay online. It spreads into the real world. Here, Christmas ornaments with images from Auschwitz were sold via a global online shop. Holocaust distortion has even found its way into campaigning. Using the term Holocaust in connection, for example, with this um, animal protection organization, PETA, this struck me very much because um, the campaign was called the Holocaust on your plate. The 2004 PETA campaign compared factory farming to the Holocaust. But Holocaust distortion does not only affect public debate, it can even shape national memory. The Holocaust would not have been possible without Nazi Germany, but it would never have reached the scale that it did if the Nazis did not have willing allies and other members of the Axis, if they were not able to find on-the-ground collaborators in countries that were occupied. And these collaborators are sometimes rehabilitated today, one of the most concerning and increasingly common forms of Holocaust distortion. Shockingly so, given how far we are from the events of the Holocaust, our attempts variously by governments or interest groups or certain communities to make acceptable again or to rehabilitate the reputations of individuals whose actions or words or simple efforts helped lead to the Holocaust and related crimes. Collaborators and collaborationist groups are being viewed in a positive light by segments of society. For example, with busts honoring members of the Romanian Antonescu regime, like Mireka Vulcanescu. With statues of Hungarian Admiral Miklos Horty. Or with commemorations of Croatia's wartime pro-fascist Ustasha regime. 80 years after, uh, it happens sometimes that streams are streets are named after them, that there are public uh, symposia about them. It's a problem to honor the memory of, of persons who are perpetrators, uh, because uh, you are building models for your youth. And I think that criminals shouldn't be the models of behavior that you try to present to your youth. The Holocaust is and the facts of the Holocaust are often being distorted in order to um, whitewash uh, history. Nations want their glorious past. They want their, that's how they build up their national identity. I think that there are different reasons behind uh, the different initiatives of rehabilitating uh, perpetrators or collaborators uh, of, of the Holocaust. The idea you can divide the personalities of a person that you can honor someone as a scientist or as an anti-communist fighter without mentioning his role during the Holocaust. And I, th I think that's a, a mistake. Unfortunately, the process or the incidence of uh, rehabilitation of uh, personalities who are perpetrators or collaborators of the Nazi regimes can be found everywhere in the world, in, in, in Europe, in America, in Australia. Unfortunately, we are seeing this uh, phenomenon. I can think of no more overt case than this, than the case of Roman Shukevich. He was, among other things, a Nazi collaborator. There's proof that he engaged in crimes against Jews and others in Ukraine. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the Ukrainian parliament rehabilitated him in an official way. And just two or three months ago, they renamed the football stadium in Tirnopol in Shukevich's honor. And the problem with rehabilitation is you are making acceptable people who were inherently unacceptable. 
You're turning criminals into heroes. A particularly shocking form of Holocaust distortion is the glorification of mass murder. Every year in February, a few thousand people from across Europe come to Budapest to commemorate the German Waffen SS and Wehrmacht. They wear Nazi uniforms and symbols and hold anti Semitic speeches in public. We have also noch heute den selben Feind wie vor 75 Jahren. Der Feind heißt nicht Müller oder Meyer. Nein, unser Feind heißt Rothschild und Goldmann und Sachs. Holocaust distortion appears everywhere where you see extremist nationalism, hate groups, and uh, political movements that victimize one group rarely restrict their victimization just to that one group. That's why learning the lessons of the Holocaust are important, because it can give you the warning signs of an encroaching worldview of built upon hatred and ethnic racial division that can lead to real violence. Holocaust distortion paves the way for anti-Semitism, denial, conspiracy myths, and dangerous forms of nationalism. There's not a single country where you do not have Nazis marching the streets from time to time, but there's also very few countries where you do not have right-wing extremists uh, who made it into parliament. So right-wing parties in parliaments often using that platform to spread Holocaust distortion. Holocaust distortion is a threat to society because we will totally lose historical accuracy. We will, we will not be able to build on the facts. We cannot learn from them and then we can fall in the trap of forgetting and repeating. And that is why we have to stop it at an early stage. These photographs were saved from the belongings of those deported to the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp. The destiny of the people shown remains mostly unclear. Many of them were probably murdered during the Holocaust. These photos give a rare insight into their lives before the Holocaust. Let's keep their memory alive, undistorted. A very warm welcome to our panel discussion. My name is Yolanda Bretman. I work at IRA's permanent office and I'm very pleased here to speak with excellent colleagues here tonight. Let me introduce Brigitte Beiler, former director of the uh, Documentation Center of Austrian Resistance, member of the Austrian delegation, and together with Juliane Witzel and Robert Williams, co-editor of the publication IRA is also launching today. Ambassador Victor Mikula from the Romanian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, head of the Romanian delegation to the IRA and a very supporting diplomatic voice for Holocaust-related matters. And with us from Washington, Dr. Robert Williams from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, member of the US delegation to the IRA and former chair of the IRA Committee on Antisemitism and Holocaust Denial. We want to discuss um, today how we can better understand Holocaust distortion and how we can use resources like the film, like the publication, uh, to better counter Holocaust distortion. Uh, we'll have a conversation for about 20, 25 minutes and then um, open the floor for some questions for the audience. I want to give um, Brigitte um, uh, I want to give you the, f uh, first, uh, the floor first. Um, so in addition to the film, Ira is also launching um, the booklet, Understanding Holocaust Distortion. Um, and you've been a, a leading expert in that. So how, how does this publication help us to better understand Holocaust distortion? The uh, already mentioned, in the film mentioned, uh, working definition on Holocaust denial and distortion uh, just gives rough guidelines how to understand and what to understand with uh, the term and the facts of Holocaust distortion, because Holocaust distortion is not almost easily to identify. It comes in various disguises, it comes in various ways, and therefore uh, some IRA experts 
uh, started working on the booklet which is launched today. Uh, we want to give more detailed explanations what Holocaust distortion is like, to make a, give a better understanding about it and to put it into different contexts in which it can seen, it can seen it, it can met, been met. Uh, we, the editors, hope that we were able to give a better understanding of Holocaust distortion, its background, its social, political context, the various forms it comes in. We start in the brochure with a historical context. Historical context, in fact, starts already with National Socialism, National Socialists trying to hide the true horrors of the Holocaust. These efforts found their follow-up quite soon after the war in various countries where the Holocaust had taken place, first of all back then in Germany, Austria and France. And later on, Holocaust distortion spread into various geographical and ideological areas especially. We deal further on with the different geographical background because it makes a difference what uh, polit po post-war political development different countries and regions had experienced after 45 and the decades later on. So we find uh, different motives for Holocaust distortion in this, these different regions. It makes a, uh, in, for instance, in regions formerly under Soviet in influence, Holocaust distortion takes on another image, another picture comes in another form uh, than in Western countries or the Middle East context, which is a special case again. And Holocaust, as it was stated before, is not just limited to one political field. It's not limited to right-wing extremism, though it uh, surfaces there most often. But it comes in various political fields and later, and especially recently, we have seen it just in the middle of society. It's not only it's worse, it's really bad. The um, distortion of the memory of the victims we now see in the course of the anti-corona measure demonstrations, but you have it in some not so easily seen forms in many parts of society. If it's uh, telling about the history of the great grandfather, which didn't take any, didn't do anything bad, but so, uh, it's really necessary to raise the awareness uh, for that problem. And we hope that we can help with that publication to raise the awareness. We give concrete examples so that people can really understand what we mean by our, our theoretical explanations. And therefore we hope we had, we were able, or uh, are able to present an appropriate tool for dealing with the grown problem of Holocaust distortion with that publication. And before uh, I end, I just want to thank my co-editors, that's Juliane Wetzel, who can't, unfortunately can't be here today, Rob Williams, Robert Williams. The three of us spend long hours of work, of discussion, of rewriting, of thinking and cooperation to finalize the text you can find on the IRA website today. And we have to thank experts from the various uh, IRA member countries who contributed with their knowledge, with their experience to that project. You will find their names in the booklet. And last but not least, I want to thank the colleagues of the Permanent Office for their support and especially you, Jolana, who is leading <laughs> us through this <laughs> event today. You can't avoid my thanks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this overview um, and for this summary. As you said, so for our audience, you can find both resources um, on the website and also links to, to those resources in the chat. Rob, I want to bring you in. The film and the publication, they both stress that today distortion is actually the bigger issue than denial um, and that it's growing. Um, so... What would you say, why is that, and, and, and what do you predict will happen in the future, in the next five to ten years? Uh, <clears throat> it's a big, expansive question, and I know we have limited time. So, um, <laughs> all right, Let's just start with what we've seen happen over just the last 
few years, you know, distortion's really been metastasizing in new and complicated ways. You know, in a few countries, including in some I remember countries, there are more and more attempts to rehabilitate the reputations of people or organizations who are complicit in Holocaust-related crimes. In some countries, this has led to lawsuits to overturn long past sentences that were uh, made by earlier courts. Occasionally, such as in the Romanian case of Nicolae Macic, these attempts failed. Other times, courts made the decision to open the door to the possible veneration of such people. And this problem is complicated by the fact that in certain cases, some of these individuals were involved in other seemingly positive pursuits in their lives, like the anti-communist resistance or in the North American variant, the race to the moon. Unfortunately, those who venerate these people often choose to conveniently forget the more troublesome, amoral and murderous aspects of these individuals past. And I think this is something we're gonna to continue to see happen and we need to be prepared to respond to it in a more robust way. Also, as we move forward in time away from the years 1941 to 1945 toward a future without Holocaust survivors, we're going to see, I'm afraid, more and more of what we've seen over the course of the pandemic. Attempts to misuse, make light of, or repurpose imagery or words that we associate with the Holocaust by people who are trying to draw attention to a completely unrelated cause. We're also seeing particular forms of Holocaust comparison or more accurately, Holocaust minimization among some scholars and advocates who wish to draw attention to other genocides. A certain growing sense that there's been too much attention to pay to the Holocaust as if there isn't enough capacity to look at multiple phenomena at the same time. And this is dangerous. And it's led some to falsely and cynically claim that a focus on the Holocaust can be used to cover other mass atrocity crimes. We have to be prepared to push against this as well. But I'm an historian, and the reason I'm an historian is the past is much easier to predict. There are a lot of variables in the future that are beyond our control. So what can we control moving ahead? Well, we can educate. We need to use the materials created the, under the auspices of this global task force and the IRA to sensitize multiple audiences like students, professional cadres, journalists, and policymakers to sensitize them to the ways that distortion appears, why it's so dangerous, how it relates to anti-Semitism, and how it relates to other biases that are threatening both emerging and established democracies. Well, I'm hearing um, the forms of, thanks so much for the, uh, explaining the various forms of distortion, which I'm hearing are not, not, going, not, not going anywhere and may stick with us for, for a while, even more the reasons to be equipped well and to, to tackle those. Um, we had two historians, Victor, I want to bring in a different voice and a uh, diplomatic voice. So for you, why is understanding Holocaust distortion important and why is it important not only for historians, but for policy makers and decision makers? Well, thank you for, for the question. Uh, I'm an economist, uh, and we are uh, facing Monica. the same dilemma as the historians. <laughs> we, are, we are very good at explaining the past. Nobody wants to uh, predict what's coming. Exactly, very, very bad at predicting the future. But the, the problem is, without repeating myself, uh, because in the movie I was speaking about how cynical is uh, Holocaust distortion, uh, I will offer you three arguments for, for dealing with this. One is that the ones that are generating the narratives of Holocaust distortion know very well the Holocaust. Maybe the ones spreading the narratives could spread the narratives because of ignorance, but the ones generating the narratives distorting the Holocaust know very well the past and they are deliberately falsifying our history. Second is that Holocaust distortion is moving to mainstream politics. Mm -hmm. Now we are not speaking about minor uh, political groups uh, at the peripheries of the societies. Unfortunately, we are seeing in some cases governments promoting Holocaust distortion as part of their official policy of rewriting the history of their countries. And third, because there is a potential international spillover effect. Some of those governments do not limit their attempts of rewriting history to their history in, within the boundaries of the territory. Some of those go uh, governments have an international agenda of rewriting Holocaust history by distorting the, the history of the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. 
it's a, it's a very international international problem which we've seen in the in the film i think um, we've seen in the brochure and now hearing from you very clearly which is good that we have an international audience here to discuss it let's talk a bit a bit more about um what we can do <laughs> against holocaust distortion um rob maybe you want to start um this round so what can people what can segments of society individuals policymakers what can we do yeah i mean i touched upon this a bit earlier in my first answer, but I'm going to touch upon it again in, in a more detailed way. There are a few things that we can do to help educate and sensitize people to the problem. First, and it seems obvious, but we need to enhance educational opportunities to learn about the Holocaust as a subject and disinformation more generally. Why do I say disinformation? Don't be mistaken. Holocaust distortion is an inherently adaptable form of disinformation that is used to sneak in messages of all kinds, including messages that seek to undermine democracies and cultural pluralism and acceptance. And as we improve such learning, we need to go beyond the secondary school. Secondary education is an essential foundation for later in life learning, of course, but we also need to engage with the Holocaust, with anti-Semitism, and with related topics in our universities, in our trade schools, and professional education courses, and in the training of our civil servants and our journalists. Related to this, political responsibility is essential. We all know that the Holocaust is a topic that's misused for all manner of political or ideological gain. And it's our responsibility as members of society, as members of an international community, or as members of governments to speak out against, types of, against misuse of this type and not allow the Holocaust to be a cudgel that one opponent or one country uses against one another. As for new media, there's been a lot of talk about social media companies and their responsibility to deal with forms of online disinformation and hate. And this is certainly true, and we applaud the, many of the efforts moving forward, but we have to talk about our responsibility as the users of these platforms. We need to engage in better ways of communicating the factuality of the Holocaust, as well as the tactics necessary to kind of root out distortion and disinformation when we encounter it, because those who are at least self-consciously engaging in distortion are much better at reaching certain audiences than we are. Mm -hmm. I think I'll let others answer, but that's that's a lot already. That, that was a lot. Let others. Um... <laughs> Victor, challenging <laughs> to come next in your view, would you, um, what, what is important when we think about countering Holocaust discussion? Uh, Robert is very right about uh, Holocaust as, uh, as a disinformation tool, Holocaust uh, distortion as a dis disinformation tool. And uh, because uh, the attempt is to undermine not only the confidence uh, in state institutions, governmental institutions, uh, not only the confidence in justice, not only the confidence in mainstream media, in watchdog of, of uh, the societies, in the education system, in uh, the health system, uh, basically this information is being used in order to undermine the confidence and the trust of the society in all the institutions that are specific for democracies. Mm -hmm. So this is why we have to, to tackle uh, Holocaust distortion and we have to tackle in an innovative way, we have to take into consideration that mainstream media doesn't cover most of what is being discussed on the internet. We need to, to build a coalition, a virtuous coalition, with persons that are relevant on the online uh, area uh, and who are not necessarily equipped to deal with, uh, with messages that are distorting the Holocaust. We need to discuss with influencers, with bloggers, with uh, new persons that are manifesting themselves on, on the online, trying to, to, to present themselves as models of behavior for the society. Mm -hmm. So distortion is, an, is not only an international issue, but an issue uh, that can be found on so many levels of society and that all those levels of society need to act. I'm tempted to say we have a lot of those. Um, um, we have many viewers with many different backgrounds here today from many different countries, um, but also from many professional backgrounds, so um, academics or educators. Um, uh, representative of international organizations, policymakers, ministry um, officials. So, um, 
there's a lot they can do. And maybe Birgitte, it's a difficult question, maybe. But what is, do you have a piece of practical advice? What can, what can our viewers do to counter distortion? Uh, you just manage the variety of audience we have got today. And I think uh, almost, not almost, every one of us, uh, be as a, a historian, being a politician, being a decision maker, being a journalist, I think we can do something which sounds on first sight quite simple. We can make distortion visible. Because distortion uh, in many ways uh, can't be identified easily or people are distorting without any, any backhind thought, just not thinking. And I think, and I confess I do it personally in many private surroundings, if anyone comes up with Holocaust distortion, every one of us can counter it, can make it visible, can say, okay, think, what are you doing? What was the Holocaust? And you can do it in private life. Journalists, I think, could do it in their profession. Decision makers can stop listening to Holocaust distortion without reaction. We have to react. And we have perhaps spontane to spontaneously react. But if we don't react, we give them the space to spread and to grow. And I think that, mm -hmm. we sh sh that should be stopped. Let's mm -hmm. do one, one call, of, uh, call to action for <laughs> yeah. our audience here. Um, I want to follow up a bit on um, how to counter distortion and look back and, and have this last round of, of questions. Um, before we turn to questions from the audience about how we can use the two resources in a more concrete way. So the film um, and, the, and the booklet. Um, um, so, Victor, start this round with you. <laughs> Why are resources like the film and the publication um, needed? And, and specifically, what can we do? What can policymakers and civil society, how can we use the film and the booklet? I think that's... What's your wish list? <laughs> well, I think that uh, these are two, two very good tools for starting a discussion. Mm -hmm. We are not speaking about tools that are exhausting the subject. I, there are tools that are there and that you can use in order to start a discussion with different audiences. In my case, uh, what I will do in the next weeks will be to, to use these tools in order to start a discussion with prosecutors and judges. We have a National Institute for Magistracy in, in Romania. And I, I, I want to introduce this into their educational programs in order for them to be better equipped in assessing the social impact of facts that are related to mm -hmm. Holocaust distortion. Because some, some of the prosecutors might say, well, this is an idea of a crazy guy. We, we, sh we, should, we shouldn't waste time or resources in prosecuting um, them. I, I want them to understand how dangerous it is to ignore Holocaust distortion because anti-Semitism has already left, led in the past to such tragedies as the Holocaust. And by distorting the Holocaust, basically you are diminishing uh, your uh, immunity uh, system uh, in front of, of potential uh, political movements that uh, have are promoting hate and, and might lead to atrocities. Very inspiring, I'd say, <laughs> and uh, potentially a role model for, for many other IRA delegations and what to do with those resources. Um, Brigitte, how can we use these resources? What, is your, what are your uh, dreams, dream, hopes and dreams? Oh, dreams. <laughs> uh, I think there are is a, a whole list of resources IRA has, has uh, published and uh, developed in the last years. The film, the booklet, the working definition, the campaign, protect effects, recommendations for policy makers, rec educational material. And that, like Victor now said, should be used in very different se settings in very different surroundings. You can use it in the schools, you can use it at, uh, at the university, you can use it in courses at education system for the grown-ups. Uh, so I, I would just hope and wish that that material is used and that material is combined with the spreading of knowledge about the historical facts of the Holocaust. And uh, 
our publication it can be downloaded from the website and I think uh, the tools are on the table and now they can be used in, in various uh, areas of society, in various fields of education, in, in various fields of, of courses and for, and it may help journalists, for instance, like I said before, you have to, uh, you can only stop Holocaust distortion if you make it visible. And that visibility, hopefully, is helped by that material IR has produced. Rob, same question to you. What are your recommendations um, on how these resources um, can help raise awareness, how we can use them? Well, unsurprisingly, I, I agree with the argument made by my co-panelists mm. to make use of the materials. Um, these should become resources for others to use, but who is best suited to raise awareness or how can we use these, I'm gonna ask a different question, how can we use these to develop more knowledge about the dynamics of distortion? You know, so to a certain extent, everyone can use these resources to raise awareness in a general sense but we still need to learn more about this subject. We must approach this subject in the right way because right, well, I often say that Holocaust distortion can be a gateway drug to Holocaust denial or outright anti-Semitism. This is true. And this is why the messenger matters. The person who speaks on these subjects needs to know the subjects and whether she, he, or they are comfortable with the subject of de Holocaust distortion remains unknown because it's a relatively new field. We also have to be able to respond to uncomfortable questions about distortion and also be comfortable with the very real possibility that we might not know the answer to every question. We also need to look seriously at this content because it's the product of international expertise and development. It's accessible. Now, can it be improved upon in the future? Perhaps, but it's available right now to make use of. And the best way to consider making use of it is to provide opportunities to learn through the IRA network, to build upon the capacity of the organization for dialogue and discussion on the challenges of distortion and how best to respond to it. You can work closer with the IRA and with the group involved with the Global Task Force, colleagues like Brigitte, who's here, Juliana Wetzel, Mark Weitzman, Rob Rosette, and others, because these experts, including myself, were all available for discussion with you and for your, with your audiences, whether they're at the governmental or non-governmental levels. And thanks to our newfound comfort with Zoom and WebEx and other technologies, quite honestly, we're more available than ever. All right, but beyond distortion, I think it's important to remember, and Brigitte touched upon this a bit in her answer, that ultimately over the long term the best solution to the problem of distortion, the related phenomenon of denial, and other denial and distortion of related mass atrocities and genocide is knowledge about the subject. Not just knowledge about Holocaust distortion as a phenomenon, although this is an important dynamic, but the Holocaust as part of our shared national and international histories. We need more education on the Holocaust and in more educational circles. We need solid and unbiased research and scholarship to continue. And we need to constantly reaffirm our commitment to innovate how we commemorate the Holocaust. We must do all of these things in order to not just remember what happened, but to reflect upon what was taken from us, taken from us all, and to consider what might happen in the future if we turn a blind eye to propaganda and hate. Thank you, Rob. Almost perfect words to end the debate, but let's have a look at some questions from the, from the chat. Maybe you can turn that on so that we can integrate our audience a bit and have a look. It's a, can, may I ask the tech team to scroll up a bit so that we can see the beginning? Wonderful. So thank you so much. So I got some notes from behind the scenes support. Thank you, Fanny, so much that I should mention there will be a recording of this panel discussion um, online um, after this event. And there were many positive remarks about Ira's focus on this topic. I have a note that Yehuda Bauer would like to take the floor. I don't know if this is technically possible. 
Unfortunately, it is not. I'm very sorry about that, but let's um, integrate him into our IRA discussions uh, during the IRA plenary meetings, which are taking place this week. So we will definitely um, um, hear you there. Um, and then we have questions. I'm a I have on my notes from Johannes Berman to address, address how police, law enforcement and judiciary could be targeted about this issue. We touched a bit upon that um, by Victor and Rob. Would you want to um, give a bit more insights about how, how police, law enforcement and judiciary could be, could be targeted by IRA's efforts and these resources? Uh, you can do a special training and that happens in Austria, uh, but only uh, in foremost concerning neo-national socialist activities and Holocaust denial, because that is a case for the Austrian law. Uh, Holocaust distortion uh, is only rarely in, in, in rare cases possible to prosecute by law. And I think that's very different in all various uh, countries and even I remember countries we have Robert Williams is steering a inter very interesting project on memory laws, uh, which is tackling just that problem, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not finished yet. Uh, but it depends, but you can, of course, in training courses for the judiciary, for state attorneys, for police forces, raise their av awareness and, uh, for that problem and make them sensible for the surfacing of Holocaust distortion, because in many cases, Holocaust distortion goes hand in hand with the other things, with hate crimes, which are under forbidden under law in many countries of the European Union. So um, it makes sense to make special trainings. Mm -hmm. I, I would add to that that uh, we also have to, to build uh, a platform of dialogue between the civil society, uh, the law enforcement agencies and, and the judiciary, and to, to use that dialogue in order to see if we need to upgrade uh, the legal resources. In our case, uh, we have legislation punishing Holocaust denial, we have legislation punish, punishing anti-Semitism. Nevertheless, the civil society is, is telling us that the, the track record when it comes to number of, of uh, final sentences, number of cases brought to court based on that legislation is, is uh, very small in comparison with the number of incidents. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, a public platform that will allow the civil society and the law enforcement agencies and the judiciary to, to discuss about the implementation of the law allows them to improve their training, to find innovative ways in improving their training, and also allows the public policymakers to improve the legislation if the problem is with the interpretation of the legislation. So you, you, by building these platforms, you can improve both the implementation and also uh, the, the, the legal process in, in building uh, uh, legislation. And I would like also to, to, to touch up upon another thing. Uh, there is... Um, a rebirth of nationalism in, in, in Europe. And uh, uh, Holocaust distortion is somehow encouraging this rebirth of a distortion version of nationalism. Uh, nationalism that is built mostly on superstitions, is built mostly on mystification of history. And within the process of mystifying the history, you have this rehabilitation or attempts of rehabilitating uh, uh, perpetrators and collaborators of the Nazi regime. So I think that we can use these two tools also in order to address the, the threat that these pseudo-nationalistic uh, new political movements are uh, presenting to, to the society and to the democratic institutions in which we are basing our societies. Distortion. Rob, do you want to add anything on the question of police, law enforcement, judiciary and training programs or your, the project of memory yeah. laws, forget to mention? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, as an American, we don't have the same sort of hate speech provisions that a number of European countries have. So I'm going to take a different approach to the same question. Uh, I, I think uh, I'm in agreement with the, the, the statements of my uh, Austrian and Romanian colleagues, but beyond police, at least police in the street. I think that this is a subject 
that would be of interest and perhaps some considerable importance for a number of our intelligence agencies. So police from a different point of view. Uh, because distortion, as Victor just uh, pointed out, is a topic that is used by well, state and non-state actors uh, in attacks against governments or to foment unrest in certain societies, having our intelligence agencies aware of some of these dynamics could be an important step in the larger disinformation wars that we're fighting right now. Thank you. We have um, a few more questions. One from Jose Gizir, uh, which is, should we also, when we talk about the issue, if I summarize it correctly, when we talk about Holocaust distortion, also think about, there it is, extreme left-wing progressive context or extreme Islamist fundamentalist context? We tackle that in the publication anyway, because it's, uh, uh, like I said before, uh, Holocaust distortion surfaces in many political fields and in many ideological areas. And therefore, we uh, speak about that in our publication as well as leftist Holocaust distortion, as well as uh, most of the problems uh, coming up in the Muslim surrounding are connected, strongly connected to the Middle East conflict. And we speak about that as well in the publication. So that's covered. I, well, I can jump in I, um, before the ambassador maybe on, on this. Uh, Yossi raises a very important point. And I made reference to certain trends in scholarship right now that, that have a certain ideological bent. So I think our, our duty to push against forms of distortion is a duty that is irrespective of ideology and irrespective of um, religious orientation. There are certain forms of distortion that are encouraged by Islamist circles, yes, but it's not just in the Muslim world that we see this. There are extreme right-wing Catholic organizations that engage in their own mm -hmm. forms of distortion, uh, as well as some forms of distortion that appear in Orthodox Christian churches and occasionally uh, the polytheistic faiths. So I think we need to go into this eyes wide open and push back whenever distortion rears its head. We're going to have another question on context of distortion. I'm reading it out loud. So uh, the question reads, I'm based in the Krakow area and intend to work as uh, in a museum after I complete my postgraduate studies all the success for that. What could be, so the question is, what could be the most effective ways to combat Holocaust distortion in that regional context, if one is a public historian? Well, that's a, that's a, a major challenge, uh, and that comes from, from an economist that is sharing the same dilemmas as the, the historians. Well, one of the common features uh, of um, Holocaust distortion in the eastern border of the Aira family is the fact that when you when you study the history of the Holocaust, you are studying sometimes connected to the history of the communist regime, mm. and uh, of course you have to 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 do a proper research of both uh, totalitarian regimes. You have to to study uh, the history and the specificities of it. And you have to, to narrow the margin of maneuvering of the ones that are trying to build artificial comparisons in between the two regimes in order to relativize both regimes. I think that that's a major danger. And as a professor of history in Krakow, it is important to, to, to be sure that when you are teaching about the communist and you're teaching about the Holocaust, you're discouraging these artificial comparisons that actually produce Holocaust distortion. Mm -hmm. Brigitte and Rob, I see nodding. Do you want to add anything or should we move on? No, I uh, fully agree. <laughs> fully agree. Um, moving on, I'm seeing from Luigi Makota, should we react in front of each oh, and every distortion, such as street demonstrations of people wearing yellow starch or other symbols related to the Shoah, or keep concentrating on a more sophisticated approach, not giving too much visibility to what are, at the end, sheer provocations? Where should our priorities be? 
personally, I think it's quite difficult to stay calm and say nothing. And I think especially uh, media coverage of those manifestations and demonstrations should at least point to the fact of, of uh, is, uh, Holocaust distortion connected with it, because I, I don't believe in just keeping silent and just overlooking. I think if those things are happening, we have to name them. But if I may add, um, you cannot remain idle. This is a luxury that we don't have. We cannot look at the Holocaust distortion and remain idle, uh, con considering that the, the ones promoting Holocaust distortion uh, shouldn't be challenged. Uh, but you have to pick up carefully the subjects where you are challenging uh, uh, the ones promoting Holocaust distortion. Mm -hmm. I think that to, to wear the yellow star in anti-vax manifestations mm -hmm. is one of the, of the, of the uh, Holocaust distortive events that needs to be challenged publicly. Uh, you can select, you can try to see what are the uh, stories that are being uh, uh, disseminated at a very accelerated uh, pace, maybe even us using artificial intelligence, and those are the ones that you need to challenge. Not marginal uh, views of marginal groups uh, that you can actually help and uh, and uh, uh, you have you can mm -hmm. help them disseminate their message if you are reacting to that. So we shouldn't react to everything. Mm -hmm but there are ways and means to establish what are the narratives that need a reaction in due time, at a very early stage before it becomes uh, uh, something that, uh, that is damaging uh, our societies. Thank you very much. I got handed, I would suggest we address two more questions. Um, I have one from Yandi Boot. Um, it reads, is it a coincidence that Holocaust distortion is increasing parallel with the increase of identity and nationalism ideologies and policies? No, <laughs> it's, not, it's not coincidental. Um, we see historically over time in times of particular we'll call them political crises and or uh, in times of information crises. I think, you know, there's an element of the, the information crisis at the moment at play that rumor mongering becomes common, uh, scapegoating and uh, for other forms of bias become common and a certain degree of, well, a, a lack of belief in the firmness of truth mm -hmm. also somewhat becomes common. And, and I'm afraid we live in an age that some scholars are calling denialism where all manner of fact are being called into question. There are, as we all know, people who deny the climate crisis, people who deny the fact that the earth is a sphere. Uh, you know, there, there is a general problem of the moment and distortion uh, is able to capitalize on it. But there is something particular to the last almost two years that has sent distortion uh, into into overload, not just distortion, but anti-Semitism as well, which is a related phenomenon at times, uh, that has been able to make use of the pandemic, the uncertainties caused by the pandemic, and, and um, it's becoming twisted and, and manipulated in new ways that we, I quite honestly fear, haven't quite grasped yet. So I think this is, this is something that we need to continue pushing for. But yes, times of crisis lead to more crises. Yeah increase of identity and nationalism ideologies and parallel to the rise of distortion? Well, it, it is not a coincidence. I, I, I share com completely the, 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 the opinion of, of Rob on, on, on that. Um, and this is why I'm, I'm saying that the ones producing the narratives are very cynical because they know the history. They are just producing, mm -hmm. a, a, let's say, a new narrative of the past in order for them to to fulfill the political goals or their or, or their political movement. Yeah. The Holocaust distortion fostering national feelings or nationalistic feelings. Looking a bit at the time, and I would ask one last question. 
um, and then wrap up. And I'm reading from the chat from Barbara, what responsibilities do social media companies have to counter Holocaust distortion on their platforms? Would the IRA resources being launched to be of help for them? Well, they, they bear a lot of responsibilities. I have to, to tell you that in, in Romania, we, uh, we face the, the challenge of a, a small market for, for the social uh, platforms. That means that uh, they are spreading uh, Holocaust distortion stories and they are blocking the accounts of professors trying to counter Holocaust distortion. And I think that that's a major responsibility of the online platforms. And uh, uh, in order to, to improve their performance, they need to open themselves to, in, to independent auditing of their algorithms, because it seems that today their algorithms are built in order to promote Holocaust distortion and to block in, uh, attempts of legitimate attempts to counter Holocaust distortion. I think that's a big problem we are seeing in other respects as well. It's uh, concerning the spread of anti-Semitism. It's concerning the spread of hate speech, hate speech. Um, and that's a discussion which I'm sure will accompany us for years to come because it c can't be easily solved. Mm -hmm. Rob, so final, I have final a, words, yeah. responsibilities of social media companies and IRA resources. <laughs> No, I, so I have, I have a particular take on this that I know is different from many people, but you know, I think we need to do more than wag our finger at social media companies and tell them they need to fix things. They certainly do. I'm not denying that. Um, however, I, as I said earlier, we also have a particular responsibility to become better communicators through these platforms. And at the end of the day, I hate to take a Cold War analogy, but the, at the end of the day, one of the best um, uh, responses to propaganda is counter propaganda based in fact. Uh, this has been this was the approach of the West during the Cold War and it it yielded benefits from time to time. We need to develop fact based counter narratives and those counter narratives need to be based in history, but they also need to be communicated in a way that is accessible for online audiences at, irrespective of the platforms that they're on. And, you know, the different platforms will have different modus operandi that we need to operate within but you know we have a responsibility as well the only way we can go about doing that is to make use of the ira materials in a way that is cooperative with these social media companies we can certainly train their flaggers or the people who are removing content on how to recognize these issues but we should also engage in dialogue with these companies so that we know how to fill the gaps that exist online so that we can put better content out there mm -hmm. i know that's very pollyannish of me but i think that that's ultimately the solution i'm afraid we need to close our session looking at the time and i do want to apologize that we did not get to address all of the questions uh, and all of the comments that were posted in the chat today but we'll definitely um, continue this conversation um, at many at similar events uh, within ira meetings over the next days so there will be um, lots of opportunities um, to continue the discussion on how to understand holocaust distortion and how to counter holocaust distortion i would like to thank our panelists very very much for your contributions thank you very much uh, and katrin meyer for opening remarks um, as well as all the ira colleagues who worked on the resources we launched today and of course everyone who worked on the preparation for this event i would like to thank the national for for hosting us here in lovely vienna tonight um, and i would like to thank the greek ira presidency so for having this event um, as a side event of the IRA plenary meetings, which are ongoing. And lastly, many thanks to all, to our audience for um, your questions, for your comments, and for um, your patience. Um, we look forward to staying in touch and have a good rest of your day. <laughs>